be here now. Just be here now. And when we look as parents, when we become parents or look at others, what's most astonishing to see is how what comes out of us, like automatic pilot, is what was done to us. And we repeat it unless we learn consciously another way. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. The only way to speak about parenting... that really that really matters is to speak from the heart when the buddha first started his own teaching he began with the first noble truth the basic truth of suffering and its cause and the freedom that we can come to if we understand the suffering in life in some way it is the duty of a dharma teacher to speak about that which is true there is, of course, both joy and suffering in parenting. But parenting in America is in crisis. Sometimes it's a terrible thing to go to parks and supermarkets, especially if you have a little kid and you bring them there to play at the park or take them around the market. And you see some two-year-old walking down the aisle in the supermarket with their mother knock over something accidentally and the parent come back and smack the kid and yell at him and say don't you dare do that and the kid's kind of shaken up and saying doesn't even understand because they knocked it over accidentally you know what do they want from me i'm just learning to walk um, all the kid learns in that is that they're bad and that there's something wrong and that when you don't like something you hit somebody else or you go to the parks and you see people treating children in ways I do that make me cringe, you know, and yelling at their kids, if you do that again, I'll whatever it is. Um, and uh, making kind of war on children. It's not that these parents, that most parents don't love their kids, but they don't know what to do. Often mom is tired you know, she's got three kids and financial troubles and a bad marriage and didn't sleep very well the night before. And all that comes out in the way that we relate to our children. I go in sometimes to help in Caroline, my daughter's class in the elementary school, the local elementary school here, where nearly half the children are in families that have been divorced. And you can tell when you walk in the classroom often the kids who are from families in difficulty it just takes about two minutes, you know, or the kids who are being raised primarily by TV and junk food. You know, even in affluent Marin, there are a lot of kids you can feel it when you walk in the class. You feel their pain and their fear and disconnection and speed and all of those things. The largest number of poor people in America and the largest, the most, the greatest growing number of poor people below the poverty line, which is pretty low, is children. But nobody's allowed to say anything to the parents in supermarkets or parks or even, you know, the parents who have kids in your school. I found it's quite interesting that there's a greater taboo about talking about how you treat your kids than there is about your sex life or how much money you make. How you raise your kid, you do not say that to another person. It's like they are a possession and I can do with my possession what I think is right. There's so much strong ideas and conditioning and also 
so much guilt and pain and fear. Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And when we look as parents, when we become parents or look at others, what's most astonishing to see is how what comes out of us like automatic pilot is what was done to us. And we repeat it unless we learn consciously another way. In our modern technological society, just as there's an ecological crisis, you know, the litany, toxic waste, ozone layer, deforestation, species extinction, that's caused by a disconnection, a loss of connection with nature, with the nature of the world that we live in, that we're a part of. Just as there's a crisis in homelessness or in hunger, in a rich society and a world that's with enough to feed every hungry child, every hungry human being could be fed on this earth for less than 10% of what is being spent on weapons and arms annually worldwide. There's also, along with the ecological and homeless and hunger crisis, there's a crisis in parenting. The same loss of connection with nature the same loss of community and village, the same loss of the values of the heart has taken place in child rearing. We're trying to do something new in our culture, which is to raise kids without village and without community. There aren't grandmothers and elders around. There aren't dads and grandparents. They're all at the office or in the factory, some town down the road, or they live someplace else in the country. There aren't uncles to take the kid, or aunts to take the kid when we're overwhelmed and can't be good with their children, or uncles to initiate the teenagers so they don't have to go out and try to find initiations and find out what it is to be a young man or a young woman out on the streets with drugs or guns or whatever, seeking to discover themselves. There isn't community to teach children as they grow the art of being a productive community member. There isn't a community for us as parents to hear stories and learn practices and have elders and teachers that keep us connected with the tradition of millennia of what benefits human beings, to help us stay connected with our instincts and our hearts. So for 25 years, for a lot of the upbringing of many of you in this room, America read in books that you should bottle feed your children instead of breastfeed them every four hours and let them cry, you know, until it was time. When every single wise culture in the world knows that when babies cry, there's a reason and you pick them up and you feed them or you hold them. No, let them stay in that little crib with the bars and cry until they cry it out because we'd lost touch with what... It just takes a second to be around a crying baby to know that the appropriate thing is to pick it up. I mean, you have to, you have to really fight against yourself not to do it. In the 1920s, there was a very famous school of psychology and education with a lot of followers that taught parents that it was bad to touch their children. So we've lost this connection with instinct. Now, good parenting wasn't a question in the Buddhist time. The Buddhist childhood, he was raised as a prince by his mother's sister, because his mother died when he was young, and by nursemaids and given every kind of care and attention that's appropriate to a child. One of the most important experiences in the enlightenment or in the awakening of the Buddha came after... He left to practice as a yogi, and he did six years of the most intense ascetic practice that anyone could do in India, of fasting and starvation and and, um, holding his breath and lying out in the cold and the snow or being on beds of nails or whatever it was. He said every great ascetic practice he tried in order to get rid of his desires and fears and overcome his anger and master his body. 
until he nearly died, until he came so close to death that people who saw him weren't sure whether he was still alive or had died. And then he realized that it didn't work, that you can't fight against yourself and get rid of your desires and anger because the very fighting against yourself is your desire and anger. So after taking that to the greatest extent that he was able to, he sat down exhausted and had a vision come to him from his childhood. He remembered being a young boy sitting in his father's garden under a rose apple tree. And he remembered sitting in that garden and having arise within himself a sense of well-being and stillness and wholeness, a kind of connectedness and concentration or a state of great and wonderful well-being. He remembered this sitting in his father's garden. And he realized that he had gone the entire wrong direction in his practice. That that well-being, not fighting one's body and heart and mind, but that that well-being was the basis for spiritual life. And so out of that, he discovered the middle way of not asceticism on one hand and not indulgence on the other, but of honoring one's body and one's heart and one's mind and caring for it. And he took food, he took milk rice, he took nourishment and began to care for himself. And out of that, strength returned and vision returned and loving kindness returned. And he was enlightened. Now, the Buddha had this to draw on, this this, uh, well-being from his childhood. And I love the image of him sitting in his father's garden under the rose apple tree, feeling this well-being. But often we don't have this to draw on ourselves in our childhood. And it's even worse if we look at the next generation. Last year, the New York City Teacher of the Year was awarded his honor, being the best teacher in the city. And when he spoke um, in front of the mayor and the school board and thousands of other parents who gathered, he castigated them all for the sole murder of one million black and Latino children. And he went on to describe the pain of the school system in that city. And then he said, think of where it comes from. It comes from you, he said, looking around. Think of the things that are killing us as a nation. Drugs, brainless competition, recreational sex, the pornography of violence, gambling, alcohol, and the worst pornography of all, lives devoted to buying things, accumulation as a philosophy. All are addictions of dependent personalities, and that is what our brand of schooling will inevitably inevitably produce in the next generation. It's pretty painful to hear, isn't it? Very different than that image of the Buddha. We have increasing number of kids who are raised primarily by TV and daycare. Huge numbers of hours in daycare centers. The level of materialism, the advertisement on television, the kinds of things that we're teaching our children. 18,000 murders and violent acts the average child sees on movies and TV as they grow up. Materialism, violence, just the stuff we're trying to undo in our spiritual practice. We are feeding the next generation of children. We have a society with the highest infant mortality rate of any industrialized culture because we don't give prenatal care to poor mothers. We have a society where, through advertising, Ninja Turtle books outsold all the other top 20 children's books combined in the last year. If you want to know what American children are reading... Or on the other side, we have the hurried child, you know, where now we're going to fix it by testing our kids and seeing that they do better on SATs. 
and the hurried children who come to doctors at age 8 and 9 and 12 for stress. You know, because their parents push them since kindergarten to get into a good prep school so that then they can go to a good college and make a lot of money like their parents. You know, or special things that you can buy for your children to begin reading to them in the womb. You know, so that they'll start to learn how to read and flashcards for infants and stuff like that. It's true. It's sick. Most importantly... And most painfully, we have children growing up, many, many in our society, and this is the, the greatest concern for me, who are not really bonded to an adult, who miss the early years of holding and connection, the years and months of that, that create a sense of well-being, that are more connected to video games, often violent video games, than they are to people. Kids who grow up with a hole inside, who don't have any real sense of what it means to love, no real capacity for intimacy because it wasn't taught to them. Here we are, a nation of commuters, one person in a car, big houses, one person in each bedroom often, lonely adults and unbonded children. Then you wonder what happens when these, these kids grow up. What will happen? We can see it when we come to meditation retreats ourselves. If we didn't get what the Buddha got, what the Buddha had, that sense of well-being sitting in his father's garden, then a lot of our spiritual practice will be simply dealing with grief, unworthiness, self-hatred, abuse, addiction, Rage. How many of you have dealt with that a lot in your spiritual practice? Half of you would raise your hands, I know, or more. When the Dalai Lama recently spoke in a small panel with a group of Western psychologists, he was amazed to hear about self-hatred and unworthiness. He didn't even understand it, because in Tibetan culture, children are loved and held. He went around the room, he was so befuddled, that he went around and he asked everyone in the room, do you feel unworthiness and self-hatred sometimes? Yes. Do you feel it? Yes. Everyone in the room nodded yes. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that this was a culture where people primarily talk about their difficulty with their parents instead of honoring them. He just couldn't understand that. When we do deep spiritual practice, Some of the grief and sorrow and pain we touch is the sorrow of the world. But much of it is a loss of connection that we have, is our loss of connection with one another. Much of it is the hole in our soul or our self, that longing to be connected. We all face it to the extent that we didn't get it in our childhood. For the next generation, it's even more. Parenting is a labor of love. There's no other way you'd keep your kids in those difficult moments, you know. And it's the path of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. It's service and surrender and patience and understanding and tremendous sacrifice, all of that. It is also a way to reconnect with the mystery of life and to reconnect with ourselves. Um, my daughter Caroline recently we went through the Christmas season um, and some of her friends told her she's seven years old that there wasn't such a thing as Santa Claus that it's really your parents and she's just at that age where the sense of real mystery is getting uh, fainter and she's starting to see things in the uh, more grown up way So she came in right before Christmas and announced to us, I don't believe in Santa Claus anymore. I think it's parents. My friends told me. (laughs) Beside which she said, I don't see how he could fit down our chimney. He's too big for our chimney. She was kind of thinking about it and inspecting, now. how big is Santa? I've seen him at, you know, this Macy's or wherever it was, and how big is our chimney, right? 
<laughs> and we said, well, there really is a Santa. Kind of went back and forth about it. And she said, all right, I'm going to test him tonight. I'm going to leave out milk and cookies and see if he eats them. And then she left a note. It said, dear Santa, I don't believe in you, spelled <laughs> B-A-L-E-E-V. I don't believe in you. If you are real, leave me a note tonight, Caroline. <laughs> So she fell asleep, and then she woke up in the morning, and uh, there was a note for her that said, Dear Caroline, thank you for the milk and cookies. If you stay up late next year, you can see me. Love, Santa. She came running into the bedroom and said, He ate them. He ate them all, and then he left a note. He must be real. There are so many presents. My parents would never get me all that stuff. And what's very interesting to see at the age that she is is this beginning shift from the mystery of things to that which is more concrete. She's mostly been living in a mythological world and a mythic one in a timeless place where reindeer fly and Santa Claus appears. And now she's beginning to take out the tape measure and measure how many inches wide is the chimney and how many houses are there in Woodacre. Now, how does Santa Claus do that? But for a long time, children live in the mystery that doesn't measure things with tape measures and doesn't count houses. And I can take her out still at night and we go out and look up at the stars. And she looks up and says, what are the stars? What is that? And it kind of reminds me or anyone who's with a child to really look in that way at this mystery we find ourselves in. Now, it's not just young children that connect us with the mystery. How about the mystery of sex, those of you who have teenage kids, huh? Nobody understands that mystery, I assure you. I mean, we do it, more or less, but no one understands it. And then there are all these teenagers kind of trying to grapple with hormones and embarrassment, you know, and love and what all that's supposed to mean and so forth. Not particularly easy. What did you have in school today, a father asked his teenage son. Oh, we had lectures on sex, was the reply. Lectures on sex? What did they tell you? Well, first there was a priest who told us why we shouldn't. (laughs) Then there was a doctor who told us how we shouldn't. (laughs) Finally, the principal gave us a talk on where we shouldn't. Gee, Dad and Mom, would you, let's, I mean, they don't come and ask you about sex, but something starts going on, you know what I mean? So our kids are a vehicle for us to come back and really look at ourselves and our life and the mystery around us. We can easily sense it, how connecting with children, how much they live in the moment, how much it can be a spiritual practice. Now suppose in the spirit of the great discourse the Buddha gave on awareness or mindfulness, where the Buddha says to awaken, one should pay attention to breathing in and breathing out. One should be aware standing up and bending and stretching. One should be aware moving forward and moving backward and eating and tasting and going to the bathroom and sitting and going to sleep. One should be aware when the mind is contracted and fearful and agitated. And be aware when one learns to let go and the mind is balanced and filled with equanimity and understanding and peace. Then the Buddha recommends sitting in meditation or even ascetic practices, sitting up all night or contemplating the sickness of the body or aging and developing a loving empathy for the suffering and the poor as well as that which is beautiful in us. Now suppose that he spoke to awakening instead in a discourse as a parent. What would he say? Pretty much the same thing, I'd imagine. Pay attention in the same spirit to your own and your children's body. Be aware as they sit and stand up and move and eat and go to the bathroom. That's the practice of being a parent, is being with that, but pay attention, bring mindfulness to it. And then instead of sitting up all night in meditation, sit sit up all night when your children are sick. 
or know when they're afraid and when it's time to hold them or comfort them or hold a child who is hurt with loving kindness and compassion. And in this, develop awareness and patience and surrender. Parent is, parenting is a spiritual practice for our own awakening, letting go over and over and over again as our children change, the art of letting go. Parenting is also a way of giving from our heart into the garden of the next generation, of leaving the earth a little better than we found it. Derek Bach, who was the president of Harvard University, said that um, at a great speech celebrating the fourth century of Harvard, that Harvard has gotten better each century. The freshman class bring in a little knowledge, he said, and the departing seniors seem to take away hardly any. So (laughs) gradually it accumulates. In some way, to parent is to plant something that's beautiful Mm. onto this earth for generations ahead. Now, what would the principles of conscious parenting be beyond the practice of mindfulness, as the Buddha described? It would be the principles, first, of attention or listening. Again, the quality of mindfulness. Listening to the Tao, to the seasons, a reconnection with that which is intuitive in us, with trust, with our instincts. Remember the story of the African tribe? I want to tell it again tonight because it's so appropriate for this particular talk. There is a tribe in Africa who counts the birthday of a child not from when it is born, nor even from when it is conceived, which is so, the birthday in certain cultures, but from the day the child was a thought in its mother's mind. And then when the mother thinks of having a child with a particular man, seriously, she goes out and sits under a tree in a field or in the woods, quietly listening and waiting until she can hear the song of that child. And when she's heard the song of that child, She returns back to her village and she teaches it to the man who will be the father and her lover so that when they make love at some point in that process, they sing the song of this child, inviting it to come and join them. And then as she grows in her pregnancy, she sings this child's song to it in her womb and teaches it to the women around her so that at the time of birth, The midwives are there and the child is born. And when the child comes out, they all sing its song to it. What a beautiful reception instead of getting whacked on the (laughs) rear end and held upside down to see if you cry. I mean, I'd cry if you held me upside down and whacked me on the rear end too. And then as the child grows, when it has difficulty, it falls and it hurts itself. The villagers all learn a song, pick it up, hold it in their arms, sing his or her song to the child, comfort them. Or when they go through a rite of passage at puberty or other times, part of the honoring is to sing the special song of this being to them. When they get married, their song is sung. And finally, all the way to the end of their life, if they live old and lie there ready to die, Their friends and children and grandchildren and relatives gather around, and one of the last acts is to circle around them and sing to them for their last time their song. What a beautiful way to listen to another human being. And this is the spirit of conscious parenting, this kind of attention, to listen to the song of the child in front of us, If the little kids that we have or around us are fussy, why is it? Why are they singing the crying song? What's going on with them? What is their pain or their frustration? There's something to be learned in it. There was a five-year-old boy who was watching television a lot during the period of the Vietnam War when news was on and his father would be watching it and so forth. And he kept asking questions about the war and he kept being upset and how big is the war and, you know, 
um, how, well, how did we get into it and what is war? And his father kept trying to answer him. Well, you know, there, there's another country far over there and some people believe that it's the right thing to defend um, the freedom of these people and tried to explain it in all these ways to the kid. And the five-year-old boy kept asking the same question night after night. And finally, his father listened to what he was really asking underneath all those questions. And he sat his little boy down and he said, you know, the war is very far away and it's not going to come here at all. It's not going to come anywhere where near our home. And we'll do what we can to help the people in that war and to help bring it to an end. But you don't have to worry. It's not going to come near our house. And then the little boy became peaceful because that is really what his heart had been asking. That's what we are all asking in ourselves as well. So this is that quality of listening, whether a little child or a five-year-old or an older kid, shy or embarrassed or excited or learning something new or afraid or having a bad day. How do we react to them? Do we notice what they need? Are we there to listen to them, to be really present? When we do that, then we understand how to raise our children. It is like listening to the Tao. How long to nurse our babies? Or how late to allow our teenagers to stay out on dates? And it's the same process of listening to what's right. To teach ourselves and them to pay attention to the rhythms of life, to breathing in and to breathing out. To sense and know very deeply that children want to grow and to develop a trust in them so they trust themselves. This is from an article on dependency in Mothering Magazine, which is one of the best journals that we receive in our own household and also one of the most radical ones in terms of looking at the whole world in which we live. We have a cultural bias toward dependency against dependency, against any emotion or behavior that indicates weakness. And this is nowhere more tragically evident than in the way we push our children beyond their limits and timetables. We establish outside standards as more important than inner experience when we wean our children rather than trusting that they will wean themselves. When we insist that our children sit at the table and finish their meals rather than trusting that they will eat well if healthful food is provided on a regular basis. And when we toilet train them at an early age, rather than trusting that they will learn to use the toilet when they are ready to do so. It is the nature of the child to be dependent, and it is the nature of dependence to be outgrown. Dependency, insecurity, and weakness are natural states for a child. They're the natural states for all of us at times, but for children, especially young ones, they are predominant conditions, and they are outgrown. Just as we grow from crawling to walking, from babbling to talking, from puberty into sexuality, as humans, we move from weakness to strength. We move from uncertainty to mastery. When we refuse to acknowledge the stages prior to mastery, we teach our children to hate and distrust their weaknesses, and we start them on a journey of a lifetime of conflict, conflict with themselves, using external standards to set up an inner duality between what is immediately their experience and how they're supposed to be. Begrudging dependency because it is not independence is like begrudging winter because it is not yet spring. Dependency blossoms into independence in its own sweet time. That's as much true of our meditation as it is of our children. This is the quality of listening, listening to the seasons, to the Tao, to our instinct, which allows us to become what the famous British psychologist Winnicott called good enough parents. You don't have to be perfect or great. You just have to be present and good enough to hold them, to bond, to connect, 
to communicate a trust and a well-being in them and in life. A second principle beyond that of listening or mindfulness is the principle of respect in parenting. Remember the story I told in the summer when we returned, my family and I, from our uh, sabbatical trip to Thailand and Bali. My daughter Caroline had studied two months of Balinese dance, which young girls in that culture often do. She had a wonderful teacher, and at the end of the two months, he asked if she would like to have a recital. She was quite excited by this. So near the end, last week of our stay, we went to his home, which is also his school, and they set out a stage, and she got there. And it was time for the recital, and they got the music ready and the musicians ready. And then they started to dress her. And they took a long time for dressing a six-year-old whose general attention span is about five minutes. First, they dressed her in a silk uh, sari or a silk skirt, sarong. And then they put on this beautiful gold chain around her waist. And then they took this silk embroidered with gold thread and they wrapped it 15 or 20 times around her chest. Um, And then they did um, gold... Uh, armbands and gold bracelets and gold necklaces. And then they put her hair up and they put golden flowers in her hair. And then they did makeup, enough makeup for a six-year-old girl to die for. They did her hair (laughs) with beautiful black Indian colors and, you know, they did her eyelashes and they put stuff on her cheeks. And I'm sitting there getting impatient waiting to take pictures as the proud father. When are they going to finish dressing her and get on with the show? And it went on, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Finally, the teacher's wife came out and took her own golden necklace off and put it around my daughter. Really, she was thrilled. And then it was time for the performance. And what I learned in watching that process, after I saw my own impatience, was that they dressed her and cared for her for that performance because she was an artist. And in Bali, children are not children. They're called small men and small women. (laughs) And if you are four years old or six years old or 21 years old, you are still honored and respected as an artist. So she was given the same care in her dressing that would have been given to the princess of Ubud, to put on her great dance performance in the palace that same evening because they don't dance for the audience. A true artist in Bali dances for the gods and they prepared her to dance for the gods. Imagine what it would be like if you were held with that kind of respect in your childhood. The level of respect that she was given as an artist made her dance beautifully. Imagine how that would be for you. So this is the second principle of conscious child rearing. Teaching respect for ourselves, for one another, through valuing children, through valuing our bodies, our feelings, our minds. They may be limited. Children may be limited in what they can do, but their spirit isn't limited it's often greater than our own. At least the, their access to it is more, more immediate. Now, part of this respect is also the setting of boundaries and limits, which needs to be done in child rearing, but can be done in a respectful way, a compassionate no, an explanation of why it's not possible. We can set limits with respect. Children look at how we treat them, how we treat ourselves. How do we treat our body? How do we respect our own feelings? Is it okay for us to cry? Is it all right for us to touch one another, to be sad, to be angry? Respect. A family settled down for dinner at a restaurant. The waitress first took the order of the the adults, then turned to the seven-year-old. What will you have, she asked. The boy looked around the table timidly and said, I would like to have a hot dog. 
Before the waitress could write down the order, the mother interrupted. No hot dog, she said. Get him, uh, get him um, meatloaf with mashed potatoes and carrots. The waitress ignored her. Do you want ketchup or mustard on your hot dog? <laughs> she asked the boy. Ketchup, he said. Coming in a minute, said the waitress as she started for the kitchen. There was a stunned silence when she left. Finally, the boy looked at everyone at the table and said, You know what? She thinks I'm real. <laughs> what matters in raising children is that respect. Do we respect ourselves, our bodies, and our feelings? Do we respect them? Sometimes, if we didn't get respect, we still have this hole in our soul, and we may need therapy, or we may need spiritual practice or something to relearn or rebond or reconnect with ourselves. Because if we didn't get it, it's often very hard. We need to learn it ourselves before we can give it to someone else. But every being on earth, plants, your co-workers, your lovers, your kids, your grandparents, every being thrives on respect, thrives on that quality of caring and honoring that we can give to our children. So there's listening or attention. There's respect. A third principle in conscious parenting is integrity. Children learn by example, by who we are and what we do, and not by what we say. They watch our presence what do, we com- what do we communicate by the way we drive, by the way we talk about others, by the way we treat the people that we meet casually in our life or the people close to us? An old sailor gave up smoking when his pet parrot developed a persistent cough. He was worried that the pipe smoke that frequently filled his room had damaged his parrot's health. He had a vet examine the bird. After a thorough checkup, the vet concluded that the parrot didn't have uh, pneumonia or cystococcus. It merely had been imitating the cough of its pipe-smoking master. (laughs) That's how children learn. We teach them by our being. Are we at ease or agitated? Are we impatient or are we forgiving? I remember when some friends went to one of Tibet's greatest meditation masters, Kala Rinpoche, and said, what age should we start to teach our children meditation and spiritual practice? And he said, how do you know that you should teach it to them at all? Don't bother doing that. He said, what your children need to learn is is what you communicate from how you are. You don't know what their destiny is. Their destiny might be to be a teacher or a farmer, or a pilot, or perhaps a Buddhist monk or a nun. What matters is not that you give them any spiritual practice, but that you do your own. Kids learn by example. Children learn what they live, a poem by Dorothy Law Noble. If children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If children live with praise, they learn to appreciate. If children live with fairness, they learn justice. If children live with security, They learn to have faith. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with acceptance and friendship, they learn to find love in this world. Kids learn by our example. Both the Dalai Lama and Krishnamurti said the most important thing they could do in their teaching would be to start schools for children, teach people how to teach children. This kind of integrity, this kind of respect and integrity I've spoken about, requires that we slow down, that we give a lot of time to our children, 
that we participate in schools, that we read to our kids or we read to our neighbor's children. Befriend a child if you don't have one of your own or help the children in a refugee family in your community. Often we think we're too busy. We need more money to pay off you know, the payments for our second car. And there's lots of social pressure to work and produce. Don't do it. Be there for your children. Raise your kids. Take the time to play. Your children can help you reclaim the child of the spirit that most of us so long to be in touch with. The last principle of conscious child rearing is loving kindness. It is the central image in the Buddha's teaching of loving kindness where he says, like a mother holding and protecting her beloved child. Discover discover a loving kindness like a mother holding and protecting her beloved child for yourself, for your own children, and for all beings in the world. We've been taught to control kids with discipline, by shaming them, by hitting them, by blaming them. And then when we come and sit in meditation, how much pain do we see from the blame in ourselves? How much judgment and shame and scolding do we find just trying to sit quietly? How hard we are on ourselves. happens not just from our parents, happens in school. You know, children who are taught, you don't have a good voice, mouth the words, right? And they never sing again. On my report card, Jack participates very nicely in the group singing by helpful listening, right? (laughs) You know, or you can't draw. How many of us were told that we can't draw realistically and stop doing the beautiful drawing that every child knows how to do and haven't drawn a picture since third grade or whatever it was. And how sad it is when there isn't that kind of loving kindness brought. Children really help us learn a kind of caring and a love. They become teachers for us. And they teach us what really matters in life which is love itself, finding that love can outlast anything and overcome any barrier, that in the end, that's really what matters. When Mother Teresa says, we can't do great things in this life, we can only do small things with great love. She's talking about raising children as much as anything. Parenting is a place to astonish yourself with your love. There are all these stories of mothers picking up cars, doing impossible deeds, picking up cars that have rolled over their children. Or, or, or a story I read of a mother who was in a wheelchair, a paraplegic whose young child fell in the swimming pool and rolled her wheelchair over into the swimming pool and somehow, using just her arms, got out of the wheelchair and got her child and dragged her over to the side of the pool and held on for enough hours until someone came home to get them both out. Children and what they bring out of us, the kind of love that they can bring from us is astonishing and wonderful because they reconnect us with our true nature. We all long for a time, like under the tree in Africa, where there's listening and there's connectedness. And we all long for community, to touch one another, to be held by one another, where the child in each one of us is honored. And when I speak about parenting tonight, it's not just all of the children in the community, but it's the children in us as well that long for respect and listening and attention and loving kindness. It is through our parenting, through our children, that we can reclaim or restore this love. In parenting the children around us, in supporting other parents, in supporting our schools, 
At the New Year's retreat that I just taught on the East Coast, one man came in who had been working for the last year with sick children at Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Institute in New York, kids with cancer. And he came up to me, and I asked him how it was going, and he said, there are a lot of saints in this world. Most of the ones I've seen lately are black women in the guise of home health care workers. But we too can do this with children. Remember from Chief Seattle, teach your children that the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the children of earth. The Buddha said that to repay, the Buddha said that we can't repay our parents. That no matter, even if they were difficult, painful parents, that what they did in giving birth to you and raising you couldn't be repaid even if you carried them around on your back. I remember a couple of years ago, I was walk, taking a walk in the spring in San Anselmo, um, and there was this young mother, a harried young mother, pushing twin stroller with two little twin boys in it. And I'm a twin. I have a twin brother, fraternal twin. So I went up to her and I said, um, I'm a twin. <laughs> you know, I love looking at your twin boys. And she smiled. She looked pretty tired. You know, and this was in early May. And I said, yeah, I have a twin brother. I, I, I remember a stroller just like that. And she said, um, she said, you know, Mother, Mother's Day is coming up next week. I said, I know. She said, get your mom a really good present. <laughs> Even if we were to carry our parents on our backs, we couldn't repay them, said the Buddha. But we can begin to repay them, he taught. And all the generations, parents and children... By bringing the Dharma, which means respect, integrity, deep listening, truth, loving kindness, to them, to our parents, to our children, to all of life. Now, don't think that we need to be richer or have more time off to parent well, you know, because we get into this cycle of speed and consumption in our culture, and we lose sense of things, or we see all the difficulties around us. We can either see this as a world, a kind of dog-eat-dog world, you know, where every being is in danger of being eaten by another. Or we can also see this world as a world where we feed one another. It's the same process, eating one another or feeding one another. If you look in the third world, in really poor cultures, in Asia, in Africa, in Mexico, families with lots of kids, they're always in a lap. They run around. Kids are loved. They're included in all of the family activities. There's always a place to be held. There's always a place for them when the parents are working or when a ceremony or a celebration is done, when spiritual things are done, when, when work things are done. Children are loved and valued. It doesn't need more money or more time off. It really needs our care and our love. And in this, we learn in ourselves the great gift of the Buddha of generosity and respect that awaken us. We bring this gift to the earth. Let your eyes close for a moment, if you would. And as you sit quietly, feeling your body and breath, Remember yourself, picture yourself as a child, as a two or three year old, or a seven year old, (coughs) or a 13 year old, (coughs) puberty. And remember what you most wanted as a child, what you most needed. And now think, if you will, about how many children like yourself at two or three or seven or 13 
or hungry or cold, how you would feel at those ages or frightened or confused or (coughs) without enough food, without security. And sense deeply what it would be to really care for our children. We'll only become a humane society when we feed the children who are hungry and clothe the children who are cold and care for children with respect and loving kindness, integrity. When every child who is born is cared for as the Buddha himself or herself. I want to close by reading from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He speaks about this life that we live and what to value in it. He says, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest criticism and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty and find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. Let's do a little loving-kindness meditation to end. Um, Someone came up to speak to me during the break and said that their goddaughter, Ariel, who is one year old, um, is in Kaiser Hospital um, and was just diagnosed with metastatic cancer um, and has all the tubes and things of modern medicine. Um, And he asked if we could do some metta, picture some loving kindness, picturing Ariel. And I'd ask that we start with her and then picture all of the children of the world, the ones on the streets in Brazil or San Francisco, and the ones in big, beautiful homes, um, the ones in every place and condition, and the children that live within each adult as well. So close your eyes again for just a minute. And feel yourself sitting here, held in the spirit of loving kindness. The phrase from the Buddha, like a mother who holds and protects her beloved child. To hold and protect yourself, to care for yourself. Your body your breath, all your feelings of your heart, your mind and creativity, to hold yourself with loving kindness. And then extend this loving kindness, picturing yourself as a child, how you would want to be held and cared for, especially in difficulty, how you would want that. And picture little Ariel in Kaiser Hospital, one year old, confused, difficult, and extend your loving heart to her, surrounding her with loving kindness. With peace,
Thank you.